So wow, has that been a personal roller coaster for the last half hour? Um, <laughs> I find myself in the unusual position that um, the previous presenters presented quite a significant portion of my deck, um, but still there's a, an interesting story to, to tell. So what I wanted to do uh, this morning is, is give a snapshot on the science um, that we've produced for the um, ICOS products, so the tobacco heating system. Konstantinos has showed some of it, but there's, there's much, much more that's available and, and published. I also want to move into the studies we've done to look at consumer perceptions, looking at the um, perceptions of adult smokers, but also non-intended audiences like former smokers and non-smokers. And then lastly, I'll just talk a little bit about the principles that we have developed and are implementing to ensure that we as manufacturers do the best we can to ensure that there are no unintended consequences of commercializing the product. So first of all, um, ICOS is just one of a portfolio of what we call reduced risk products that we are developing in Philip Morris International that includes electronic cigarettes and other nicotine containing products as well as other heated tobacco products. We believe that it's important that smokers have a choice, as Konstantinos mentioned. ICOS is not going to be suitable for all smokers and e-cigarettes are not going to be suitable for all smokers. So it's important that we deliver a range of scientifically substantiated products in order that the smoker can choose the one that's the most relevant to them. Okay, so the heated tobacco product, um, Konstantinas has already told you how it works, but just a little bit more detail. You can see on the right-hand sli side of this uh, slide here, the temperature heating profile 0.2 millimeters from the um, heater blade that's used to heat the tobacco. And you can see that the temperature of the tobacco there reaches a maximum of around about 250 degrees centigrade. This is well below the temperature that's required for combustion to happen or combustion processes to happen, which is around about 400 degrees centigrade. The temperature blade is constantly monitoring and measuring the temperature that the tobacco is at and controlling that it never gets up to the point where combustion could happen. So it's being controlled in real time. We know that combustion is not happening because we've done a lot of experiments which have been verified by independent combustion experts. And these are people who truly are experts in, the f in, in this field, including some who've been involved in development of the protocols for space missions, the fire safety protocols, and they've looked at our data and they have come to the conclusion that ICOS is not combusting tobacco. So that's the theory that we can heat the tobacco to a temperature um, that's much lower than combustion, but still deliver a taste and flavor that could be interesting for adult smokers and potentially make it easier for them to switch to this product, to a product that doesn't contain tobacco. So that's the theory we had at the very beginning of this product development exercise. But we understood, because of skepticism, that we had to do the best job that we possibly could to deliver high quality scientific evidence to show that the theory that we had was correct. So we came up with this um, assessment approach that we've been working through in a stepwise fashion over the last several years, um, going from the bottom, demonstrating this absence of combustion, showing in laboratory studies what that means in terms of aerosol chemistry, so what appears in the aerosol um, of, of ICOS compared to conventional cigarettes, and then moving into toxicology studies, so looking at what's the biological impact of the reduction in levels of harmful and potentially harmful constituents that we see in in vitro and in vivo um, laboratory models. We then moved on to our clinical studies, and we've completed eight clinical studies on the product so far, including a range of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies, several, in fact, um, four different reduced exposure studies um, as well. And we also have ongoing what we call exposure response study, which is looking at overall health effects over a six and 12 month time period, which is uh, still 
uh, still in progress. We then moved on to consumer perception and behaviour studies. So we've done a large number of studies, particularly in the United States, in preparation for our application to the US FDA, which we made in December 2016, looking at consumer perceptions among adult smoker groups and also unintended audiences. And I'll share just a snapshot of that data. But we also understood that once the product's on the, on the market, our responsibility as a manufacturer doesn't end. In fact, it's just really beginning. So we put in place a series of post-market surveillance studies that are looking at safety of the product once it's in the hands of millions millions of consumers, but then also following up using cohort studies to understand what's the effect over the longer term when a smoker switches to the heated tobacco product. So first piece of um, information that we, we really needed to understand is can we resolve the harm reduction equation with this product? So you see on the top the risk continuum. We know that conventional cigarettes in the red uh, dot on the right hand side they are, represent the, the highest level of harm for a smoker. We also know that quitting or using a nicotine replacement therapy um, is, is the best choice that a smoker can make in terms of reducing their risk. So our aim with our scientific assessment approach was to demonstrate that the tobacco heating system is far away from conventional cigarettes in terms of its risk profile and as close as possible to smoking cessation. Um, uh, in terms of uh, individual risk. But there's also an important component of acceptance. So if the product is not accepted by adult smokers and used by them, if they don't switch completely to it, then the overall benefit to public health will not be um, as, as good as it could be. So if you look at the bottom scale, the conventional cigarette is what smokers find the most satisfying and the most... Um, the most enjoyable. So we want to be up as close in term, uh, to conventional cigarettes in terms of acceptance by adult smokers. And we know that, for example, nicotine replacement therapy is not satisfactory to smokers. So we, in, in, this risk in this continuum, we want to be as close as possible to the conventional cigarette uh, acceptance and usage. So that's what our assessment approach has been um, set up to, to demonstrate. So I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of some elements of those, uh, the data that we have so far. So Konstantinos mentioned already the reduced formation results that we've published. And we have measured a total of 58 different analytes. Um, and we've done more than 30,000 individual chemical analyses in our laboratories and also in independent accredited laboratories um, as well, including 115 studies that were, were done in this independent laboratory. And the conclusions we've come to is that compared to reference cigarette smoke, so we use the 3R4F, the delivery of those, um, level, the level of delivery of those harmful and potentially harmful chemicals across 54 important um, chemicals is greater than 90% reduced compared to that reference cigarette. Just to address the point on carbon monoxide, so again, we've done the studies on delivery of carbon monoxide from the product over and over and over again, and we see consistently a greater than 98% reduction compared to reference cigarette smoke. So ICOS delivers on average 0.6 milligrams of carbon monoxide, whereas a conventional cigarette delivers 38 milligrams. So very encouraging results for all of the, um, all of the harmful and potentially harmful chemicals that we've measured. So that's really the, the, the basis for moving forward in our assessment approach. The next thing we did was look at non-clinical evidence. And here I've shown at the top of the slide um, what's called the adverse outcome pathway for cigarette smoking. All that means is what bad stuff happens in your body when you continually expose it to the harmful chemicals that appear in cigarette smoke. So it starts by absorption of those harmful chemicals, which circulate in the body through the blood, and that ends up damaging molecules in your cells that cause disruptions to the mechanisms within those cells that mean that normal function of those cells is somehow disrupted. That leads to changes within the cells and changes within the tissues that those cells uh, make up. 
that ends with physiological changes and ultimately disease. And when that's done in a, a setting, a population setting, you end up with population harm. So a number of things we can do in non-clinical studies, so non-human studies, that show um, evidence across these different parts of the adverse outcome pathway. So we can look at biomarkers of exposure in animal studies, and we've done that and, and published. We can also use omics technologies. We can look at proteomics, transcriptomics, lipidomics, and so on, to look at the damage that cigarette smoke causes um, at that um, molecular level, and understand is there a difference when we expose those um, types of models to the um, aerosol from the tobacco heating system. We can then move on to biological mechanisms, so we're looking at things like oxidative stress, which is an important repair mechanism that happens in your body, and when that, get, that gets stressed by cigarette smoke, then you start to see an increase in oxidative stress. So we wanted to understand if instead we expose to the um, heated tobacco aerosol, is there a difference in terms of the level of oxidative stress? And there are a number of things uh, in addition we can look at. We then move to, to, to more gross or larger changes, looking at cellular and tissue changes. We can look at pathology gr from at a gross level, so looking at organs, but then histopathology, where we look at what's happened to the tissues in a, in a micros uh, microscopic scale. And then, of course, we can look at potential changes that are related to diseases. So we can look at lung function, and we can look at cardiovascular disease endpoints in, in animal models. So I'm going to show you one slide that uh, really doesn't do justice to the huge non-clinical program that we have, um, but just to give you a snapshot of the evidence we have from these studies. So you see on this, um, this slide here, this is mechanistic study. So looking at those um, disease mechanisms that are important in um, lung disease and cardiovascular disease primarily, but also cancer. You can see on the very left-hand side of the chart, this is a study that was done in mice where we exposed them over the course of eight months to either fresh air, which is this sham, so sort of normal uh, circumstance, or a group of mice were exposed to cigarette smoke for the duration of the study. The third group were exposed only to ICOS aerosol, so the tobacco heating system aerosol. The fourth group, we uh, created a kind of cessation model. So the mice were exposed for two months to cigarette smoke and then switched over to fresh air for the remainder of the study. And that's the, the kind of laboratory model of, of smoking cessation. And then the final group at the far um, right-hand side uh, in the sort of amber color is what we call a switching model. So the mice were exposed to cigarette smoke for two months and then switched to the ICOS aerosol for the remaining six months of the study. And the colors you see in the slide uh, here are basically uh, an indication of the amount of disruption or da potential damage to those disease mechanisms that we see in those various different groups. And you really don't need to be a scientist to understand that cigarette smoke, exposure to cigarette smoke, is the thing that causes the vast majority of, of um, effects that you can see here on the slide. We see a huge difference between cigarette smoke, um, exposure to the tobacco heating system aerosol, and either the cessation or the switching model. Um, which um, gave us uh, real confidence that we can see on a mechanistic level that exposure to tobacco heating system aerosol is very, very different to exposure to cigarette smoke. So that was studies that were done on uh, mechanisms involved in lung disease. We also looked um, at cardiovascular disease. So this is the... Um, <coughs> the amount of cardiovascular... Uh, sorry, aortic plaque um, a, a plaque in the aortic arch, so that's basically fatty deposits that are indicators of cardiovascular disease risk. And you can see again, the uh, blue column at the far left-hand side is sham, so exposure to fresh air. The red column is exposure to cigarette smoke. We then have, in the slightly purple colour, exposure to the tobacco heating system aerosol. In the green, you have the cessation model, and in the amber colour, you have the switching. And you can see there that the effect on cigarette smoke is, uh, of cigarette smoke is far greater than any other um, of the models. 
So overall, 10 times less active in disease mechanisms and reduces risk markers to levels that are very close to those seen in smoking cessation. In humans, we can do less, obviously, but we still have a number of things that we can measure in clinical studies. What's important to note, though, is that there's no single one marker that we can measure in humans that will tell us that this product is reduced risk. We have to use um, a basket of different markers that will give us evidence um, that we can make conclusions on. So Constantinus has mentioned the biomarkers of exposure study um, that we've published, and you can see here that basically the levels of um, reduction in exposure to those harmful chemicals in smokers who switched to the heated tobacco product came very, very close to the levels that were seen in smoking cessation. And I would just pick out the figures for carbon monoxide, which are just uh, exposure to carbon monoxide, which are just in the middle here, and you can see that the levels were very very, very similar to those seen in smoking cessation. We've also looked at disease risk markers, and this was from a three-month study. Um, we didn't expect to see changes over that period of time that quite, were quite so marked as we did see. We're continuing to look at these over six to 12 months, and the indications are all very positive. All of those markers move in the same direction as those that were measured in the group who stopped smoking altogether for the duration of the study. So just quickly on behavior, so we've looked um, among thousands of respondents in studies we've done in the United States. We want to understand do adult smokers find this product attractive and appealing? But at the same time, we want to ensure that non-smokers don't find the product attractive and appealing. We also need to understand, uh, make sure that they understand the evidence that we present when we make a, potentially make a reduced risk claim. So we've had done a huge number of studies looking at this. The overall uh, conclusions are that non-intended audiences are not interested in the product, which is good news. Smokers understand the communications that we're making, and they also understand that they're still their best best option is to quit. So this is not seen as an alternative to, to quitting. And they react very positively to the proposition. But looking at what happens in the market, so once we've commercialized, Constantine has kindly already showed this, uh, this slide or a version of this slide, we see very encouraging results in terms of conversion. So we're seeing low amounts of dual use and high amounts of complete conversion, which is really important to ensure that we maximize the potential benefit of, of switching to ICOS. We also see in the commercial setting that non-intended audiences are not purchasing and using the product in great numbers at all. In fact, the numbers of former smokers and non-smokers who are using the product is in the very low single-digit percentage uh, area, which is really encouraging. But we understand that in order to ensure that we really do maximize the potential of this product, as with electronic cigarettes, we have a huge role to play. So the three main points um, here on the slide are we're absolutely committed to ensure that we are only offering this product to adult smokers. This product is not for former smokers and it's not for non-smokers. And we're age verifying our sales as well to ensure it's always adults above the legal age of consumption. We also recognize we have a role to play in helping smokers through the conversion journey. Um, we know that if we can support them through the f early stages of conversion, we really increase the likelihood that they will switch completely and abandon cigarettes permanently. And then finally, accurate and non-misleading communications to smokers are absolutely vital, both from us as a manufacturer, but also from others, for example, journalists as well, ensuring that they make sure that smokers understand what the science means and don't misunderstand it. So I'll just leave by saying um, yesterday the US Food and Drug Administration announced that they've opened the public comment period for our MRTP application. So you can go and have a look at the science which is already public and you can make your comments on our application and we really welcome them. Thank you.